Experiment 29 in Chem 12.12 is titled Magnetic Properties of Inorganic Compounds. And in this experiment, we're going to explore the properties of coordination complexes in more detail and specifically look at the magnetic properties of these compounds. As we've seen a little bit already, coordination complexes can contain unpaired electrons. And because we can think of an electron in an atom as a little spinning charged particle, electrons have magnetic properties, and unpaired electrons specifically have very strong measurable magnetic effects. So in this video, we're going to talk about the theory behind this a little bit. We're going to talk about the experimental method that you'll use in the lab, which is more complicated than it looks. And then we'll talk about the data analysis and how you can use this one number that comes out of the experimental method to calculate the number of unpaired electrons in the complex under study. So let's begin by thinking about d electrons in transition metal complexes in a little more detail. Remember, these are the valence electrons of the complex, and it's really important to understand these if we want to understand the reactivity and other properties of transition metal complexes. So to think about this, I've drawn up here an example. We have an iron center at the middle surrounded by four water molecules with two chlorines across from each other within the complex. So if we think about the charges of the individual ligands, and the overall charge of the complex, we can see that this is an iron 3 center at the middle. This is iron 3 plus. If you look on the periodic table, you'll see that iron 3 plus has 5 d electrons. Neutral iron has 8. Iron 3 plus is missing 3 electrons. And so iron 3 has 5 d electrons. Now this is an octahedral complex. So we can imagine the d orbitals of that iron center being split according to the way that all octahedral complexes are split with three d orbitals lower in energy and two d orbitals higher in energy than the baseline of free atoms d orbitals. I've drawn this twice up here because there are two ways we can imagine putting electrons into these split d orbitals. The first way is what you're used to and looks exactly like what you'd expect to be a Hund's rule. We add one electron to each level until we must pair them up and then we do pair them up, and that leads to two pairs of electrons at the bottom and one unpaired electron there. And we don't add any to the upper level because that would involve a jump up in energy. There's another way to imagine filling up these levels. When the gap between the two sets of levels is small enough, it might actually take more energy to pair up an electron in one of the lower energy levels than it takes just to throw an unpaired electron into one of the higher energy levels. And so we can also fill these levels by adding one unpaired electron to each level. This could be lower in energy overall than the setup on the left if the splitting between the levels is sufficiently small. We call the situation on the left low spin because the overall spin, if we count an up arrow or a up-spinning electron as plus one-half and a down-spinning electron as minus one-half, the overall spin here is relatively low. It's just plus one-half. The other situation is what we call high spin. It's high spin because all of the spins are pointing in the same direction. They're all adding together, and here we would have a total spin of plus five-halves, which is much greater than the spin of plus one-half that you see on the left. The question of how to determine whether a complex is high spin or low spin is an interesting one, and it's not just as simple as measuring the gap delta between the levels. One way we can think about this is by leveraging the magnetic properties of the electron, which, because it's a spinning charged particle, acts like a little magnet. Specifically, what we find is that there's very little magnetization for a pair of electrons in the same orbital level. There is actually a little bit of repulsion due to the fact that the electrons are paired when a magnetic field is applied to a pair of electrons. But an unpaired electron experiences strong magnetization in the presence of a magnetic field. We'll see what that means in a little more detail in a second. Now let's talk a little bit more about what magnetism looks like in a bulk material containing unpaired electrons. So as you've probably experienced, two materials with unpaired electrons are not necessarily magnetic on their own. In other words, they don't attract and repel one another on their own, or if they do, they do so only very, very weakly. But in a different situation, materials with unpaired electrons do act magnetic, and namely if we apply a magnetic field to a material containing unpaired electrons. What we find is that the electrons actually align their spins 
either with or against the applied field. And so here, if we imagine the field pointing straight up, you can see that most of the spins are aligned upwards, a few are aligned downwards, but there's a net alignment of the unpaired spins with the applied magnetic field. And that creates magnetization. What ends up happening is that this material gets attracted to the source of the applied magnetic field. The extent of alignment that occurs is different for different materials. And we'll see why. There's a pretty simple explanation for this. We'll see what that explanation is in a second. Um, but we can measure, actually, the amount of alignment that occurs per unit volume. And that's called chi, or what we'll refer to as the magnetic susceptibility. How much do spins align per unit volume? That's related to this force. That's related to the magnetization that occurs when we apply some amount of magnetic field. Now, this is a per-volume measure. Per-volume is convenient to work with, as it just so happens. But we can also think about the alignment per unit mass of the material. And as you can imagine, the alignment per mass is just the alignment per volume divided by the density. Dividing by the density cancels out the volume dependence and leaves mass in the denominator. Chi capital M, which is equal to chi sub M, or the alignment per mass times the molecular weight, is the alignment per mole. We're interested in this as well. This is a quantity that is intensive in the sense that it doesn't depend on the amount of substance. And what we find is that the simplest explanation for the value of chi m is just that the number of unpaired electrons per molecule in a material can vary. That's one of the key differences between a high spin and low spin situation that we just saw. There are many, many more unpaired electrons in the high spin situation than there are in the low spin situation. So if we can measure or indirectly calculate chi capital M, or the molar magnetic susceptibility, theoretically we should be able to determine the number of unpaired electrons in the material. And more interestingly from the chemical perspective, the number of unpaired electrons per molecule. So the theoretical relation here is that mu effective, or what's called the effective magnetic moment, which is just related as the square root of the molar magnetic susceptibility, the square root of 8 times chi m times the t for the temperature, is equal to the square root of n times n plus 2, where that chi m is what we'll measure. We'll talk about that in a second, how we measure that value in the lab. And n is the number of unpaired electrons per molecule. It's a pretty remarkable relation, and it captures, and you'll notice, that chi m is related to the square of the number of unpaired electrons. So if we know chi m, we can calculate the number of unpaired electrons directly. Finally, let's address the experimental method we'll use and how to use the results of experiment to calculate the magnetic susceptibility. So the apparatus we'll use is called an Evans balance, no relation. But the basic idea is exactly what's described at the top here, where we take a sample, and the sample is drawn here in blue, and we put it in a little test tube, and underneath the sample, we apply a magnetic field. And the black cylinder underneath the sample is a powerful magnet that applies basically a linear magnetic field pointing upward on the material. That leads to the alignment of the spins, and that leads to a force on the sample downward that comes out of the instrument as a reading R. We first need to take a reading without the sample because the glass of the tube can actually contribute to magnetic effects. So the glass of the tube is what's called diamagnetic. It contains only paired electrons. But the paired electrons, as we mentioned earlier, do repel slightly the magnetic field. And so that's going to affect our value of R. And we'll talk about this issue in much more detail here in a second. The reading with the sample we'll call R. And as you can imagine, this is kind of like a blank, like we've seen in spectroscopy, where we're zeroing out the effects of the glass so that the magnetic susceptibility we calculate belongs to the sample only. So the equation for calculating the magnetic susceptibility by mass is shown for you here. The constant C is just a constant belonging to the instrument. It's sort of a calibration constant related to the instrument. L is the length of the sample. The length of the sample will impact the reading R. R minus R0 is that difference between the reading we get and the blank reading. 
and in the denominator we have the mass makes sense this is a per mass magnetic susceptibility so it makes sense that the mass should show up in the denominator and then times 10 to the ninth and this 10 to the ninth is a consequence of the units we've chosen where m is in grams and l is in centimeters c will be given to you on the instrument and note that R may be either positive or negative. For a diamagnetic material that contains no unpaired electrons, there will be a slight repulsion. So the R vector will actually be pointing the other way, and the reading will show up negative. When R is positive, that means there's an attraction between the sample and the magnet, so we end up with positive magnetic susceptibility. In cases when the R value is negative, you can essentially chalk that up to the material being completely diamagnetic and ignore the resulting magnetic susceptibility because negative magnetic susceptibility doesn't really make sense. I mentioned we would get back to this issue of diamagnetism and one of the things you should be thinking about is what about all the other paired electrons in coordination complexes? Don't they act like little diamagnets and don't they repel the magnetic field? And you'd be absolutely correct and in fact to calculate the correct value of the magnetic susceptibility, we need to account for the diamagnetic effects of all the paired electrons in atoms. So we've seen that we need to correct for the diamagnetic nature of electron pairs. And to show you how this works, I'm going to go back to this example of the iron complex we looked at previously. The basic idea again is that paired electrons repulse an applied magnetic field and this repulsion counterbalances the attraction brought on by the paramagnetism of any unpaired electrons. So the result experimentally is that these repulsions contribute negatively to the reading and so the true reading in the absence of these diamagnetic effects would be greater than the one we actually measure. Put another way, the true force on the sample in the absence of the diamagnetic contributions would be greater than what we're measuring. To say this yet another way, the true magnetic susceptibility is greater than the measured or calculated from a measurement molar magnetic susceptibility. We need to account for the diamagnetism of all the atoms in the complex, including the metal ion, but conveniently values for metal ions and for ligands have been tabulated in tables for these diamagnetic effects. So all we really need to do is find the metal ion of interest, here it's iron 3 plus, and find all of the ligands, Cl minus and water, and add up their diamagnetic contributions, where we're careful to count everything so that we count in this complex chloride twice and we count water four times the molar magnetic susceptibility due only to the unpaired electrons then is equal to the measured molar magnetic susceptibility plus any diamagnetic corrections.